uh, thanks all very much for uh, uh, coming along to this lecture. It's a, a real pleasure, quite daunting audience to speak to. Um, I've got used to my job talking to 15, 16 year old kids. So that's what you're going to get. You're going to get, actually for this audience, I'll give you the 17 year old audience, lecture for this audience, just to be generous. Um, yeah, and I've forgotten the title of my lecture as well. So this is the slide I put, oh well, he's been hit 11 times. The point about this little man, this poor little man with his life of risk, is that um, he's subject to uh, being hit by a piece of lightning. Uh, the lightning is coming down from the top. There's 20 branches that it's taking between the top and the bottom. Every branch, there's an equal chance of turning left or right. So the chance of him being hit there when he's standing there, it's got, whoa, it's got to turn left 20 times in a row. So it's like taking a coin, flipping it 20 times in a row, which is roughly one in a million chances, one over two to the 20 times. And um, he's not been hit. But if I ever move him in, like some rather old Space Invaders game, um, you know, see if we can uh, uh, move, you know, can he avoid being hit? You know, it's like these lovely old things with paddles we used to play with. And, back in the old days. If I can put him in the middle, he's not going to take him long till he's hit. Yeah, let's put him, put him in there. Yeah, 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 there he goes. Whack. So um, he's going to get, well, because the distribution which we're seeing being built up with the blue bars shows that it's far more often for one of these particular um, lightning strikes to hit in the middle than the outside, because although each particular pattern has got a one in a million chance of occurring, so it's, it's very likely that all the, all the patterns so far have all been, have all been different, um, far more of them land, end up landing in the middle than on the outside. So while each particular lightning strike is a very rare event, we can actually predict pretty well very much what the overall pattern will be. And we're going to see that occurring in a number of our applications. OK, so uh, what was my title? What was I going to title? Oh, living with risk and uncertainty, yeah. Um, so as I said, I work, I'm actually sponsored by a hedge fund. Winton is a hedge fund, Winton Capital Management. I don't do financial stuff. As I said, I mainly do uh, stuff for, for children. I do stuff on football, a lot of stuff on football. I'm not going to do football today. I got a YouTube video which rather horrifically shows not one but two of me getting out of my pajamas. Um, so, uh, and that gives an idea of some of the work I, I get up to. Um, I'd also like to emphasize um, my work with the Millennium Mathematics Project in Cambridge. November, this month, I don't know if, how many people know about the Enrich website, which is a maths enrichment website with a lot of teaching resources, um, is Probability Month. It's great. It's a really cool month. So um, there's all sorts of stuff on there, um, which I'm not going to go into today. We do lottery simulations, all sorts of randomness, sociable cards, all sorts of tricks. A lot of the tricks I do with, with um, school audiences um, are featured there. So that's just a plug for some of the resources that are becoming available. OK, so um, uh, machine's jammed. Come on. Move. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to be talking about risks. I'm going to be talking about um, chronic risks, such as that, one of my favorite menus. I've, <laughs> I'm working my way steadily down that. And acute risks. For example, 76 million years ago when an asteroid hit the Earth and wiped out the uh, dinosaurs and it's only very fortunate there was someone there to take a picture at the, at the time. <laughs> so um, why should we try to quantify our risks and uncertainty? Now I've been um, you know, influenced over the last few years in my job very much by mixing with social scientists. I really say I've gone a bit native to be honest because I spend my whole time now with anthropologists and sociologists and psychologists. And so I've been influenced very strongly towards um, the fact that risk in society and risk perception, which is so important, is not an idea of mathematics, it's not an idea of numbers. And I'd like to talk about some of that psychological and cultural stuff later on. But I still, you know, brought up as a statistician, believe in the end that it's really valuable to try to put numbers on the risk and uncertainty when we can. But we can't always do that, I don't think. Because by Looking at the magnitudes of risks enables us to know how likely something is and how bad it's going to be. And it's only by putting numbers on things that we can work out whether things have got better, whether one, thing's, one thing is bigger than another, worse than another, and so to be able to make comparisons. 
But there are real problems because, you know, we, we come, a lot of people here will come from a mathematics and statistics background. We can just say, oh, well, tell people what the odds are of events happening. Well, there's a lot of interest in developing, in the, this is in the medical literature, Archives of Internal Medicine, a recent paper on statistical numeracy for health, which asked, for example, this question. A recent population asked, which of the following numbers represents the biggest risk of getting a disease? One in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10. Now, I'm not going to ask for hands on this thing because, you know, it's quite late in the day and you've all been working very hard, I'm sure. But I could make you even th start thinking about what proportion of the population actually get that wrong. And in global population surveys, in Germany, 28% get that wrong. In the USA, 25% get that wrong. And we've no reason to think that in this country the, the proportion getting it wrong would be any lower. Uh, if we're about to carry out a very large survey, which will test this, but... Um, you know, this, is, this is one of the problems with using numbers. You know, it's not necessarily clear to everyone that in this case the, the biggest number corresponds to the smallest risk, which actually can be quite a misleading way to communicate. So I, for example, have gone right off using this odds language of communicating risks, even though it's so popular and so tempting. So when we're trying to communicate small risks to people, there's a particular problem. I mean the routine risks that we face every day of our lives. And so what I'd like to introduce you to is something some of you may have heard of before, is a unit for measuring small deadly risks, rather small deadly risks. And this is a micromort. A micromort is a one in a million chance of dying. So that's the chance that that little man when you're standing there was experiencing with every flash. So if you think of it, it's like taking a coin and or me getting one of you out here and flipping a coin 20 times, and if it comes up to heads 20 times in a row, I can kill you. <laughs> okay, who would do that for a thousand quid? <laughs> hey, good, <laughs> excellent, thousand quid. I'm who would do it for a quid? <laughs> no, yay, Jim would. Great, who would do it for a quid? <laughs> Well, I did this as a science test. A little nine-year-old boy put his hand up and said, what? And I said, right, fine, we'll test it. And I started flipping a coin. And of course, I got a two-headed coin. And after about <laughs> eight, you know, who would ever flip a coin that wasn't two-headed? After about eight of these, his mum was getting a bit worried. And I said, I'm sharpening the knives. And so I let him off at the end. But I actually, it was terrible. I forgot to give him this quid for volunteering. I'm feeling so guilty about that. Okay, a micromort, one in a million chance of dying. In fact, um, the government is willing to spend about one pound sixty to uh, to stop to get rid of a micromort, because uh, the value of a statistical life, according to the Department of Transport at the moment, is one point six million pounds. So that's um, that's so divide that by a million. That means a value to prevent a micromort is about one pound sixty. So that's what that's all you're worth, unfortunately. Um, you might be willing to pay more than that to avoid one, but you do experience them. In fact, um, on average, um, we, can, we know how many you experience them because um, uh, there's about 50 million people in England and Wales, and every day 50 of them die from non-natural causes. Not exactly 50, but, you know, that's many, about 1,700, uh, 17,000 a year. So that's um, accidents, uh, being murdered, well, that's only about two a day, um, and... Uh, also, you know, uh, falling down ladders, car crashes, et cetera, et cetera. So about 50 a day. So that means that a micromort, on average, that's what we experience in terms of accidental deaths or non-natural deaths. Now, of course, the actual risk of dying, you know, gets much higher when you're older. But I'm talking about, you know, things where you wake up in the morning, pa -da, or healthy, and you you go to bed dead. You know, so that's a, <laughs> so that's that situation. So that's our. our so we could think then of how. Can we spend our sort of our daily allowance of micromort? Well, okay. Um, I drove from Cambridge today, and I'm driving back, and uh, I will be not be quite a micromort. You can get 250 miles on a normal roads, on average roads, by micromort. You can get further on a motorway. You'll get less if you're a young man on average. So this is purely an average, but you get 250 miles for a one in a million chance of death. So, um, but I could have cycled. Well, I couldn't have cycled. I wouldn't have cycled. <laughs> let's be honest. But let's pretend I could have cycled. And um, if I had done, I'd be spending about 10, 12 times the amount of risk. If I'd actually coming down the A14, it'd be a hell of a lot more than that, I'm sure. But now, or especially on the M6. So, um, or I could have walked. No, this is getting preposterous. But if you walk, you're actually only getting about 17 miles per micromore. 
the dangers from the drivers. And of course, motorbikes, for those of us, you know, not actually not me, actually, since looking at this, I've definitely gone off being one of these middle aged bikers um, because you only get six miles to a micromort if riding a motorbike. Now, if you remember that, six miles on a motorbike is quite a good unit of risk, I think. It's quite a good one for communicating an image to somebody of what other activities um, might be like. Um, so, for example, um, or we, but we could compare other activities. We could say going scuba diving, which on average is about five micromorts a time, according to the health and safety executive. Hang gliding, about eight every time we throw ourselves off a hillside, get a week's worth all in one go. Um, Skiing is um, supposed to be about half a day, so about three and a half a week. Fortnight skiing, um, your seven micromorts, your, your week's worth. And horse riding. Horse riding is tricky. It's also it's very controversial because this was the whole business where David Nutt got in trouble last year for making a comparison between taking ecstasy and what he called the addiction to horse riding, which is equacy. And, and he got in real trouble for saying they're about the same risk. Well, he's about right. You know, the sums seem to be that going horse riding is around about half a micromort a time, dangers, and um, taking ecstasy looks like it's about one micromort every time you take ecstasy. So around about the same orders of magnitude, definitely. Um, we can look at other illegal drugs, in fact, which is quite interesting. This is some recent data from my colleague Sheila Bird. Um, uh, taking heroin, for example, um, this is per week a user's heroin use, about 37 micromorts a week. It's about 200 miles on a motorbike. A woman taking heroin for a man, it's a lot higher, which is considered. And interestingly, cocaine seems to be a lot safer and more dangerous for older people. I don't know, maybe they don't know where to put it or something. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> they, so we can look at those things, but we can look at other things that we face. Giving birth, for example. Giving birth in this country, 80 micromorts. That's, that's 500 miles on a motorbike. Now, people don't make the choice between 500 miles going to Edinburgh on a motorbike and giving birth. So, but these are de almost deliberately provocative comparisons that are not supposed to illustrate choices people make, but comparing the, the risk exposure of different people in society. Um, uh, giving birth in the USA is about twice. Giving birth in Sweden is about half. Still, it's still, you know, it does seem quite high on the whole, you'd think, still, giving birth. It re re risks have reduced staggeringly, but c cesarean in this country still 170 micromorts, 1,000 miles on a motorbike. Well, you know, hell of a long way on a, in a car. So um, these are quite high, and the general anaesthetic, for a child, general anaesthetic is reckoned as 10 micromorts, and which again is not like some anaesthetists I know say, oh, having an anaesthetic, is the risk is just like crossing the road. No, no, it's like walking 170 miles. It's, and that's from the anaesthesia, not the operation. So we can go on to make even more sort of rather provocative comparisons and compare the risk exposure of people serving in Afghanistan at the moment. So over the summer, there are 23 deaths among UK forces. It's about 10,000 people. Now, this is a uniform, this is an average figure. Of course, it's going to be a lot more for some frontline soldiers, a lot less for others at camp. However, that works out as 33 micromorts a day. That's about the risk of a, of a heroin user of a week. Um, it's about 200 miles on a motorbike a day for everybody serving in Afghanistan. This is something you, know, you would not volunteer to have. But we could look at other um, uh, risks, in, uh, well, in fact, as of how those have changed over time. Um, in the UK over the last three years, we can see the dip and the increase over the last couple of years. And the USA just showed these are not random patterns. This have followed, US casualties have followed a very similar pattern until recently where uh, it's not so much the number of casualties, it's more that the, um, the number of US troops ha has, has increased so much that their rate has gone down. So um, it's still you know, an extraordinarily dangerous place to be. However, there are more dangerous places to be. Going into hospital. If um, in the last year, uh, there were these number of safety incidents reported to the National Patient Safety Agency, about to be abolished um, as one of the quangos. And about a million incidents you know, adverse incidents in hospitals were reported in this anonymous reporting system. Fantastic system. And uh, most of those didn't cause any harm, some, some severe harm. 3,700 led to the death of the patient. So these are avoidable deaths in hospital due to um, uh, a safety incident. The, that's 3,700 deaths. That's 10 people at least a day dying in NHS hospitals in England um, due to safety incidents. 
Now, about 135,000 people spend the night in hospital every day in England. Quite a, lot, a huge number, amazing number, 135,000. It's a lot, but if you take 10 a day, that's actually 75 micromorts a day being experienced by people spending the night in hospital. <laughs> about double that of people serving in, in Afghanistan. Again, it's not a choice people make between shall I go into hospital, shall I serve in Afghanistan? So it's, these are deliberately provocative. These are not the same people. Afghanistan, young, healthy, fit people. In hospital, you tend to be older people who've got other things wrong with them. It's not saying that it's too dangerous, you shouldn't go into hospital. It's merely saying, I think you should think twice before going into hospital. Now, this is a high-risk place to be every night in there, equivalent to lots of miles on a motorbike. Can't do the sums. OK, so all this really, you know, I find quite frightening when you start doing these sums and doing these, these comparisons, rather provocative comparisons. So, um, so this takes me off to my GP. So uh, this is my, my uh, GP in Cambridge. So I went along and said, well, what's my chance of going in? I don't want to go in the hospital. Said, no, quite right too. So <laughs> I don't want to go in the hospital. No, no. And, but so what's the chance of me having a, chance, a heart attack or stroke? So he said, well, your age, about 11%. But I could take statins. And uh, that would reduce the risk by about a third. Now, we've just been producing, there are all sorts of calculators on the web. Uh, this is one we've just generated to try to, looking at multiple ways to communicate to people the risks that you might face and what you might try to do about it. Now, this is deliberately trying out lots of ideas, not all of which will find their way into the final version. But the aim is that this program will end up, um, well, hopefully being used by many GPs and available to anyone on the web. Now, I have to load my personal details in, so look away. Right, so here's me. 57, my cholesterol and my blood pressure, physically active. Ha! Anyway, I th <laughs> well, let's be generous. Um, so there's various ways of, of, of communicating um, my prospects. Now, one of the, the most sort of statistical one is to produce a survival curve. And this is that my chances, measured in my future years, of being alive and free of a heart attack or stroke. For those of you doing survival analysis, this is the competing risks analysis with, with two causes of death, two causes of, of removal, heart attack or stroke, or death from other causes. And so, but what I've done is, so this is alive and not had a heart attack or stroke. And the average survival free of that, I get to 79 at the moment, it looks like I'll, I'll do that. Um, now, we could look at other things. We could say, well, what would be my prospect in 10 years' time? Because most of the... Um, uh, Communication at the moment, if you, I don't know how many of you have done this, gone to the GP and gone through all this, people of a certain age will have done this, and you get told your 10-year risk. And w the reason why is that the government guidelines at the moment is if your 10-year risk is above 20%, um, you get uh, offered statins automatically. My GP's offered them even though mine's less than that. So what this shows is that because it's a competing risk model, we can be a bit more sophisticated. And that said, for 100 people like me, at age 67, uh, six of them will be dead from other causes. This many will have had a heart attack or stroke, 11 of those. And uh, this many will be, will be fine, not have had a, a life without a heart attack or stroke. So that's my prospects. So I don't know. It's a bit gloomy, isn't it? A bit fed up. We, made, we originally started off with these as really sort of dark blue, gloomy faces. But... The, Doctors we talked to said it frightened people so much that they would never go any further. So we've had to make them a little bit more benevolent looking. Um, and uh, or we could say some people like bar charts, um, and we can look at bar charts for the, again for the chance of um, what the as a general. I'm low. I'm better than the general average. This is the average for someone my age would have this risks of, of um, heart attack or stroke, and that's my risk. Now, we can, we can put some very simple measures onto this. Because I'm actually better than average, amazingly, I'm surprised, my heart age is about 47 years. This is using a slightly old, older um, American database, but I, I, my, my risk is the same as an average person um, aged about 47, so that's not bad. And I expect to live to 78 without a heart attack or stroke. Now, what could I do about this? Could I improve this? What happens if I did take my statins? Well, if I took statins, it's likely my blood pressure uh, my cholesterol could be dropped um, to maybe to about four, and um, my uh, HDL would come up. And if I got my blood pressure down a bit, I could do this. So if I managed to do that's a bit low, 
to be passing out. If I'd managed to do all that, I, I gained this amount of survival without a heart attack or stroke. So an extra three years on average, and my survival curve raises like that. And we can see that. Now, it's not that dramatic, frankly, which is why I'm not sure if I can be bothered, to be honest. Then, so, and this shows, in fact, that um, 11, you know, out of those 11 reds, now five of them have disappeared. Well, that's a, you know, pretty, more than nearly halving my chance of a heart attack or stroke. So that's that many by, by doing that, by taking those tablets, but I have to take two treatments for that probably. So, um, you know, maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. Um, but if it, it, in contrast, though, the nice thing is if I, if I was a smoker, of course, now then it all looks a lot more interesting because then that's my gain with my treatment. But if I just stop smoking, I can really get a, get a good gain. That's... The, that's uh, pretty approximate, but there's, you know, I get a, a really effective change in my, in my prospects. And certainly the doctors we've shown this to, that image is very powerful for people perhaps who are younger and have got a, a, a already a poor lifestyle. They can, over their entire lifetime, they can get a real gain coming out of it. So this is the, this is the idea of moving to, from away from short-term risk towards lifetime risk. It's something that's um, developing a, all over the place. And it's likely that this will um, be used in the future to emphasize, actually to intervene much earlier on people in their 30s and 40s um, to change their lifestyle and maybe even start taking statins or whatever. So um, this is, it's mathematics. Behind this is actually quite a complex competing risk survival analysis. There's Cox regression analyses and things like that who know about these things. In the end, though, it comes down to trying to communicate pe to people what is actually might be the benefits of their treatment. Now, the problem is there are harms as well for treatment. And what people tend to do, if you read the medical journals or talk to your doctor, they'll say, oh, yeah, um, if you take this tablet, um, your risk is reduced by about a third. And you say, well, what about the side effects? And they say, oh, that happens rarely, one in a thousand times or one in a hundred times. So you might get some side effects. It's called mismatched framing. It's, it's a scandal, actually, um, that this appears so often in the medical, medical journals. Mismatch framing is when the benefits are expressed in terms of relative risks. Um, there'll be a 40% improvement, blah, blah, blah. And the side effects are in terms of absolute risks. This will happen one in 1,000 times or one in 10,000 times. And that has been recognized as a, a, a really bad state of affairs. And a number of people, Gigerenza and others, are really pushing for, to... to a ban mismatch framing in medical reporting and to force what's called uniform reporting of benefits and harms of treatment. So that whenever we're talking about a treatment, we always say what would happen to a thousand people getting this treatment, how many would benefit, how many would be harmed, what do you, for people like you, is this balance in favor of the treatment for you or against it? It's a really important thing because um, it could change attitudes to HRT, it could change attitudes to many aspects where people um, it might make people more willing to take treatments that had side effects, such as HRT, because of the benefits. It might also, of course, if you start applying it to some screening programs, make people less re more reluctant to take up screening. So um, I looked for data on statins and found a recent paper uh, in the British Medical Journal 2010, which followed up 2 million patients in general practice um, who had had, um, had uh, looking at their statin use. And effects of statins prescribed to 1,000 men with moderate risk of heart attack over five years, like me, so if I was taking statins. And what they reported is out of these 1,000 people, um, without statins, over five years, this is, what would, this is the sort of bad things that would happen to them that differed, were significantly different from 1,000 people with statins. Obviously, there would be other things happen to people, but it wouldn't depend on whether they were taking statins or not. These are outcomes that did differ between the people taking statins and not taking statins. So it's quite difficult to see in that image about what... This is an image we've created. It wasn't in the paper. Uh, nobody's done this before. Um, but it's quite difficult to see. So if, but if you take the, um, the difference between these treatments and actually remove the smaller bar from the larger bar, we now get an idea of um, whether the uh, benefit is worthwhile or not. We can see this is the disadvantage of, or the, oh, sorry, the advantage of taking statins is that we have this many fewer cases of heart attack or stroke and esophageal cancer, but at the cost of these side effects from taking statins. The myopathy is the muscle, the muscle um, illness that can lead, can become quite severe. 
So the choice is, you know, are these uh, you know, weighty enough to outweigh these? And of course, we could start applying weights to them, do decision theory, the idea of a balance, risk balance, which is better. But even the image provides, for me, a rather sobering, um, you know, uh, um, uh, well, it's rather sobering. And I'm not taking them at the moment. I can't decide. I'm hopeless. I mean, all this information is just dreadful. So, um, which I'll come back to in the moment. In the moment. <laughs> And of course, the other thing that actually weighs quite strongly in my mind, that as far as I know never appears in any of these usual analyses, is the thousand people on this side who are going to be taking tablets every day for five years. Now, it seems to me, even without side effects, that is a cost, not just a cost in terms of money, but a cost in terms of the medicalizing of those people, me, who are not otherwise medicalized. I'm not taking any treatments, whatever like. Do I want to be medicalized? Now, that could be a benefit. Some of these might benefit from being medicalized, for being more aware of their health, that their doctor might check up on them more carefully. But I don't want to become a patient. So this, that, this image there actually plays very strongly into my um, thinking. We still haven't found a very good way to incorporate in the general image. So anyway, anybody, any suggestions will be gratefully received. Now, using all these, what I've been talking about so far, are risks where we've got a good history, a lot of data. We can do the statistics. We can do the regression analyses. We can do the survival. We can use our statistics. That's not always available to us. So for example, um, these were uh, the odds or the probability on Barack Obama, the blue line, and McCain being the next president of the United States, as revealed in daily odds being given on a betting exchange, a major betting, I think it was Betfair, betting exchange. Now, so these are the odds at which people were both willing to lay bets and take bets. So they're as close as the, to a probability as you can get to. Now, you know, what data is this about? It's, well, you've got, there's been 43 other presidents of the United States, and they've all been white men. That's 43 out of 43 success rates so far, or a zero out of 43 success rate for black men. So you could say that this uh, sounds like pretty strong prior odds against him being president, and that's where he started off, pretty low down. In fact, you know, under some assumptions, 43, uh, naught out of 43 transforms to uh, a one out of 45 chance, which is almost identical to where he started. So, but then he went out, he was 50-50, more than 50-50 before he got the nomination. I hadn't realized that. Hillary Clinton stopped being favorite quite quickly. Um, and he dropped around this time of total collapse and briefly went below McCain. Now, it's the argument that people from, of my and many people here, sort of Bayesian persuasion of statistics, that these probabilities are just as valid probabilities as the one based on extensive data. They're based on judgment but they have reasonable betting odds, and that, in the end, is what we have to face when we make decisions. We always have to use judgment. We can't rely on just data. This is an extreme example where there's essentially no data at all. So we're probab all probabilities, ah, yeah, this is the thing. So I don't know what you think the current odds are. This is a last week on William Hill. Um, current odds on Sarah Palin being the next president of the United States? Well, it's 14 to 1 at the moment, uh, last, last week which is um, worrying in itself. <laughs> but, um, we'll see how that goes, shall we? I was almost tempted to put a bet on her, um, because if she ever did become president, there would at least be a small benefit for, for, for somebody in the world. Yeah. So we can also, uh, we realize then that probabilities and risks are not just a matter of looking at data, they're a matter of judgment. And but there also, there's a matter of distinguishing different types of uncertainty. So if I take a coin and I flip it, or before I flip it, I can say, what's the probability that this is heads? Oh. Thank you. I'm going to flip it. What's the probability this is heads? <coughs> yeah, not so quick there, are you? Yeah. Who's, who's going to say a half? Yay! The Bayesians in the organ, audience will say a half. What's your probability this is heads? It's still a half. Now, in terms of reasonable betting odds of the, of the Obama-McCain type, your probability is still a half, because those are the reasonable odds at which you, you would bet. Or maybe you wouldn't bet, but if you did bet, you would bet at those odds. Now, the point about that is that it's, a, a, it's revealing two types of uncertainty. Beforehand, it's what's called aleatory, just sort of chance unpredictability. Before I flip the coin, we'd all agree pretty well. We'd call this chance, maybe. But afterwards, we're actually dealing with ignorance, epistemic uncertainty, what we don't know. 
And of course that, crucially, is in the eye of the beholder. What, if I do that, I know something and you don't. And so we've got different probabilities, absolutely validly different probabilities. Now, that simple example carries multiple layers of meaning. And what I take away from it is that the probability is not a property of the coin. It's a property of our relationship with the coin. So it's our probability, not a property of the external world. It's a property of us, given our current judgment. But also that that is an equally valid probability on which to base decisions. So, for example, colleagues of mine um, use a Bayesian analysis in order to try to say how many people in the country have got hepatitis C. Now, that's pure epistemic uncertainty. There are so many people in the country with hepatitis C. We just don't know how many there are. There's no randomness there whatsoever. But by Bayesian analysis, they can produce probability distributions over the possible numbers of people with hepatitis C. They've actually done another thing here, which is to use, instead of a, drawing a probability distribution, they've used a probability density. They've used density of ink to represent the probability distribution, which I really like because it avoids fixating on estimates and 95% intervals. Ah, yes, now's, now's the time for a little quiz, I think. little quiz. <laughs> The, within the Bayesian argument, then, probabilities can be used to, to express about things you don't know, that are facts, but you just don't know about. So I think I might give you a little test on this. Have you all got access to a little piece of paper and a pencil? Can you all find something to write with, if, or if you can? You don't need to. You could do it in your head if necessary. But a pen, paper, paste, paper, and a pencil would be really useful. Because in this little quiz, um, what I'm going to do is give you a series of questions, general knowledge questions, and you've got to say whether you think A or B, which answer you prefer. But you can't get away with that. You have to say how confident you are in your answer. So it's like a multiple choice question, but you have to express your confidence on a scale between 5 and 10. So 5 means I've got no idea, and 10 means I'm absolutely certain. Now. This is the nasty bit. This is the scoring rule. So if you say, I'm, I say five, whether you're right or wrong, you get zero. So it just says you stay where you are. You don't lose anything at all. If you say, I'm absolutely certain, if you're right, you get 25 points. However, if you're wrong, you lose 75. There's three correct answers. Really nasty scoring rule, this. Um, so if you said, if you're being cautious, you said 7 out of 10, you get 16 if you're right, minus 24 if you're wrong. Prize for someone who works out the formula for the score. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? No, one to start, just to get the hang of it. Question to start. Okay, here we go. The question to start is, which is higher, the Eiffel Tower or Canary Wharf in London? Just say A or B, which one you think is most likely? If you're absolutely certain the answer, say 10. If you've got no idea, say 5. Something in between expressing your confidence. Right. Have you all done that? Yeah. Are you ready? And the answer is? The answer is? A. Eiffel Tower is higher. It's not that much higher. I thought it was, I thought it was more than twice as high. But 325 minutes against. So can you just score yourself? If you said 10 out of 10 on Canary Wharf, You've got on to a really bad start, I tell you. You're going to have trouble making this back. <laughs> it's a really bad start. OK, have you got the hang of it? Right, next one. Who's older, Prince William or Kate Middleton? Uh, Who's older, Kate, Pr Kate William or Prince Middleton? No, Prince, <laughs> Prince William or Kate Middleton? Or as they're, as, they're, or they're, as they're now, like Posh and Bex, they're now known as Whittleton. Is the <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? Who's older? It's Kate, Kate Middleton. It's six months older than, than the prince. Right. Okay, have you got the hang of it? All right, next one. In the IMDB rankings for popularity of films, which film comes higher, The Matrix or Forrest Gump? So which is the most popular film according to the main international movie ratings? The Matrix or Forrest Gump? Forrest Gump. And how confident are you about the answer? Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? And the answer is? A. Hey. <laughs> ah, Matrix is more popular. Okay. How are we getting on? Anyone got lots of negative points? I do hope so. Right. Okay. You're good. Good. Okay. Which is larger, Belgium or Switzerland? Kind of land area. 
larger Belgium or Switzerland. Land area, you don't have to be certain. You shouldn't know, I hope nobody knows the answers to all these, it'd be a real shame. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready, ready, ready? And the answer is Switzerland. Quite a lot, quite a lot bigger. Okay, clever clogs is, here's, uh, here's one. No get looking on your phones, no Wikipedia. Which is bigger, Venus or Earth? Which is bigger, Venus or Earth? You may have found that it's quite expensive guessing. <laughs> uh, okay, are you ready? You got your answer? Just say five, it's safe. Five, and Earth is slightly bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Only slightly. Okay, final question. Final question. Who died first, Beethoven or Napoleon? Now, I don't mean 11 o'clock in the morning or something like that. I mean, just the, just the year, the year. Who died first, Beethoven or Napoleon? Okay, your answer, your score, and the answer is B. Napoleon died first, 1821, six years before him. Right, okay. If you can add up that far, you can maybe add up your scores roughly. I think I should, I'm not going to ask you to pass your papers to a neighbour to mark. I think I'm going to trust you. <laughs> Probably all cheated anyway. Okay, anyone get more than 100 points? Anyone get more than 100? Oh, anyone get more than 75? Hey, some people do know something. Well done. Okay, those are people who actually know something. Anyone get less than minus 75? Yay! Anyone get less than minus 100? Yay! Now, I always look at this and look at the gender of the people who put their hands up. Because if, um, if you get a very large negative point, it's this, points, it's, this, it's this uncanny mixture of cockiness and ignorance that tends to be a, a characteristic of the male gender. <laughs> certainly, certainly my school's thing, so that tends to be the point. Okay, so this is a, a serious point these techniques are used to train people to make probability judgments in the face of their ignorance. It's used by intelligence analysts, by weather forecasters. You can train yourself because people start off being all, it's all 10, 10, then they lose lots and they start working out where to be. Now, you may notice that the, the rule actually is um, if you take away 25 from all those scores, you may notice that the scores go down as naught, minus 1, minus 4, minus 9, minus 16, minus 25. It's the square. It's called a quadratic scoring rule. It squares, essentially, the error that you make. And the mathematics of that, a very nice area of mathematics of scoring rules, shows that you have to have a rule like that to encourage you to be honest in your opinion. One of these rather vicious scoring rules. Because otherwise, people will tend to exaggerate. They'll be actually 7 out of 10, and it'll pay them to say 10 out of 10, to exaggerate their confidence if you don't have a scoring rule such as this, which penalizes mistakes very, very strongly. This isn't the worst. They can get worse than this. OK, so how could, should we make, uh, what should we say about projections like this? Um, these are, this is from the Bank of England website in 2007. And these are the projections they were making about the future growth of the country over the next three years. Now, the important part that is very similar to that hepatitis C things. They're using blurring, they're using shading to indicate probability. These are known as fan charts, um, um, introduced by the um, governor of the Bank of England and uh, disliked by journalists because they don't give the numbers immediately. They want, they want it to be an impressionistic feel rather than giving an estimate and a confidence in it. Now, the whole point about this is that this shows their uncertainty. Each of these blurs is a 10% interval. So that the widest one is a 90%, and the inside one is 80%, a 70% interval, 60, 50, etc. Now, what actually happened, um, when we look at what actually happened, that's what actually happened <laughs> if we follow on the series. Now, um, what, and actually, it's like, it's like Pascal, like, um, um, Fermat, there's not room enough on this slide to show the, uh, the full extent of the, of the, of the, of the, of the drop. Um, so is this a failure? Well, not necessarily, because although it's not shown, there's a 10% chance that the, 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 uh, actual, uh, the actual true growth will lie outside the whole of that fan. It's not shown on the graphic. I think the graphic should make that much clearer that that Fan only contains 90%, a 1 in 10 chance that the line will be outside there. And, um, and this is what happened. Okay, it's quite a long way outside, um, but it was outside there. 
Now, the interesting thing is that, is this, could this be considered as a shock, or is this part of the projection? I mean, is this, you know, do we go back to Donald Rumsfeld, usual quote, is this an unknown unknown? Are there things we don't know we don't know? I'd say in this particular case, it wasn't. This was, uh, it was maybe a surprise, but not a shock. And the surprises are things that, um, or, or at least, you know, there's this phrase using climate change about anticipated surprises, things that, you, you know, you don't expect to happen every day, but you have at least thought of them as a possibility. Now, we're getting now into an area where quantification, then, is difficult, where actually maybe we're flawed in our numbers we're using, both whether they're based on data or whether they're based on quantitative judgment. So I've gone through quantities based on data, quantities based on judgment. Well, you can go further. Um, and I, as a statistician, I was not introduced to Frank Knight until just a few years ago, but within economics and social sciences, he's held up very strongly as someone who years ago, before Frank Ramsey and everybody else, um, as he made a distinction between risk and uncertainty, which I still, which still widely used, in that risk is the idea of quantifiable uncertainties, things we can put numbers on. Um, he wasn't thinking about subjective judgments, but I'd put that in there. And uncertainty is when we're actually not, not happy to put numbers on it at all, which, which uh, of the sort that you were prepared to do. And Keynes, in 1937, expressed a similar sentiment. He was talking about um, what might be happening in 1970, particularly he mentioned that, 33 years in the future. He was saying about these matters, there is no scientific basis on which to form any calculable probability whatsoever. We simply do not know. Now, he was, again, talking about calculable probabilities. He hadn't um, fully engaged with the idea of, of judgmental probabilities. However, he's saying that there's areas where we just can't put quantities on. And this is very, can be quite threatening to somebody from a, a statistical background who's used to building models that where we do express all our uncertainty formally using probability theory. Um, within a Bayesian framework, we might look at probabilities of future events, but we might also have model parameters, and we express uncertainty about those due to limited information. We can even express uncertainty about model structure, about we don't quite know what structure to use, be due to our limited scientific knowledge. And we can do sensitivity analysis. We might even put probabilities over models. However, um, and many people argue that there's not much deeper areas of uncertainty. For example, things that are in your, not in your model, but you know should be in there, but you just don't know how to put them in. Acknowledged inadequacies. You might call that indeterminacy. And within climate models, for example, effects of clouds, volcanoes, the methane cycle, are not, in, not included yet um, because people just don't feel confident enough about putting them in. But they know they could have an impact. And then, of course, you've got the final circle, which is the old Rumsfeld idea, of things you didn't even think of, things you didn't even um, consider putting in the model because they never even crossed your mind. So this is all quite threatening from a, for a statistical point of view. Um, I, I don't know, but people have been thinking about this within medicine, where use of evidence formally has been, um, for decision-making, is I mean, way ahead of many other areas. You know, for decades, they've been thinking about evidence-based medicine. And in particular, I think something I find very attractive is that within the Cochrane Collaboration, which does all the systematic reviews, they've done 23,000 systematic reviews of medical treatments, they produce an estimate and a confidence interval for their, benefit, for their treatment effect, and then put an additional layer qualification, an additional layer of uncertainty, a qualitative expression of uncertainty about how confident they are in the conclusion they're making. I think that's very attractive. Um, and they, for example, use this grade scale where they grade the quality of evidence underlying their conclusion. And they, they don't do it in terms of whether it's based on randomized trials or observation studies. They use the very pragmatic criteria of saying it's high quality if, if we don't think we're going to change our mind. Further research, we've actually, you know, just about gone as far as we can go. This is the best we can do. Further research is very unlikely to change our mind. And it's low quality if, actually, we think it might be this, but something might come along which would change our mind. We're very, we're very uncertain about what might happen to our opinion in the future. It's a very important, well, a very powerful way of communicating those uncertainties at a qualitative level, not quantified. And I think that's very attractive. Okay, I'm <laughs> starting to embarrass one member of the audience. Um, just to show, um, that's my daughter, Rosie, who's, um, who's studying here in the university. That's her on her gap year in, in Mexico when swine flu was all the rage in Mexico. We were a bit anxious about it. She doesn't seem that concerned. <laughs> <laughs> we were a bit anxious about it at the time. It's very nice. Rosie and I wrote an article, a joint article in the Times while she was in Mexico. I was here. 
and in which, you know, I said, what's the risk of swine flu? I haven't got a clue. I don't know. So this is trying to engage with the idea that not all risks can be quantified. Sometimes we just don't know. And that means that we have to make decisions that are robust to error, resilience to shock, and, um, and adaptive to new information. But I would also I'd actually say that the government's response to dealing with these deeper uncertainties, um, actually, I think it's gone too, went too far, for example, in the swine flu. Because they would, they, what they do, the government tends to do, is to invest to get these worst case scenarios. If, unless they know what the risks are, they can tick all those boxes, they assume the worst. They take an absolutely pessimistic view. They look at what's the worst that could happen. So in July 2009, they were projecting 60, the worst case scenario was 65,000 deaths. And then by September 2009, it was down to 19,000 in this country. When actually, you know, people just weren't believing that as a reasonable figure. That was not a reasonable figure. And why it's not reasonable is that particular technique they used, and uh, people doing risk analysis, I think, might have a fit at this, is that these are, they take all the parameters at their most extreme values and, and then assume, put them all together and it's the worst case. So this 30% clinical cases was the extremely high end. And the one out of, one out of 300 dying was extremely high end. And they took both of them at once. Now, you put two things that are extreme, the chance of them both being extreme is unbelievably low. That's not worst case. That's sort of just unbelievably, almost infeasibly awful. You know, it's, it's too perfect stormy um, for words. In fact, there are about 450 deaths after spending two billion pounds. So, um, which may be fine, but, you know, can we always react in that way? You know, can you afford that level of caution about all risks about which there are, um, we don't know, have full scientific information? So, oh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll finish. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to carry on, but I'll, I'll finish in a minute. Uh, but, uh, we're not allowed to have the booze before quarter past seven anyways. Now, just to finish off, the point is that personal risks, I, I know that putting numbers and all this scientific stuff actually is not how risks are handled in society. People are dominated by their emotions in, in practice. So that um, people influenced by their emotion, their personality, their personal experiences, their feelings of control, um, their cultural beliefs, I'll mention that a bit more in a moment, their trust or lack of it in authority, how they feel about the house of the innocent, the victim, social norms, all these sort of things. There's been years of work in psych excellent work in psychological literature showing that all this numerical stuff I've been doing is almost always completely ignored by people when they make their judgments. <laughs> What's quite surprising is that, that this approach to a risk that's acknowledged the, the personal and the cultural has led to um, re-establishment of quite old work by Mary Douglas on cultural theory. That, you know, cultural theory from 1982, which has developed you know, an anthropological study of tribes in, in New Guinea, I think, in which she, she felt that um, the uh, fears and beliefs of people in the, in the different individuals in these different tribes was dominated by two dimensions. They, how people felt society should be organized along a hierarchical or an egalitarian axis, and whether they felt that individuals should give up freedoms for the sake of the community. And this is, she called these group and grid. This has been resurrected, been made into a very practical procedure, questionnaires developed to test people along these dimensions. And it's been found now that where you lie on this axis is enormously predictive of how you feel about climate change, GM foods, vaccination of, of, of uh, children, uh, girls against HPV, etc., etc. All these controversial issues, which we know are dominated by your culture, by your culture and your beliefs, not by the evidence. So actually just telling people you're wrong, this is the science, it's going to have almost no impact at all on many of many people who have different cultural beliefs. And uh, so I would highly recommend a very good introductory <laughs> paper on this in, in uh, Nature recently by Dan Carhan. Um, Carhan from Harvard on communicating um, on climate change and other things like that, where they do experiments, they actually get actors, they play out roles, etc., and, and then measure their influence on people's opinions. This, this is called the Cultural Cognition Project. People endorse whichever position reinforces their connection to others with whom they share an important commitment. And this, you know, I think we can just tell from our experience reading the newspapers that these cultural aspects which dominate people's feelings about risks far more than the evidence and the numbers. 
However, the numbers should be there. And I'll just finish off. Some of you may have seen this before, but I'm, so I'm not going to apologize for doing it again. But just the numbers should be there, but only the numbers that are well considered. And so I'd like to finish off by illustrating this with the worst number that's ever appeared in the British newspaper. <laughs> this number, beat the, in the Times, it said, beat that double yolks to find one in a trillion odds. Because a woman had bought a box of extra large eggs from Asda, and they all had double yolks. Picture, they all had double yolks. Amazing. So the man, they wheeled in a man from the Egg Council who said that one in a thousand eggs were double yoked. So somebody did the sums and said that, well, that must be a thousand, one in a thousand times one in a thousand, six eggs, and they get to one in a million, million, million. What's wrong with this? Absolutely everything's wrong with this. It's the wrongest number that's ever appeared. And um, why, okay, what's wrong with this? Um, first of all, um, it's implausibly small. We eat two billion boxes of eggs every year in this country. It's a huge number, it's disgusting. But we would still, in order for that, that event would only happen once every 500 million years, if that were really the problem. So, um, so uh, the parameters are wrong. They're not that rare, double yolk eggs are not that rare in extra large eggs. Um, the model is wrong. Eggs aren't independent in a box. Um, they tend to come from the same batch. So they're not, you shouldn't be multiplying up these probabilities together. But this does not exhaust the wrongness of this figure, as I found when I went and bought my next box of eggs. And there they are, in my kitchen, glass of white wine, about to have an absolute <laughs> cardiac arrest-causing <laughs> omelet. <laughs> this isn't going to do my, my cholesterol any good at all. Six eggs, all with double yolks. Isn't that amazing? Is that a one in a trillion chance? No. Because I went to Waitrose, bought a box of double yoked eggs. £2.49. Absolutely. So there's no probability at all involved in it. It's complete nonsense from beginning to end. So it really, any time there's a probability in the newspapers, it's always wrong. So I'd like to just finish off by saying that there are two approaches to risk. The brain, here's my Frankensteinian brain. Um, in which you, you, know, you try to do the maths, the rational approach, which I can't remember which side of the brain it is anyway. One side of the brain. You, you weigh things up. Or you can use your guts. Um, it's got a, a very powerful, um, you know, a lot of research showing that gut feelings, heuristics work very well for dealing with it. This and guts. It's in a picture. <laughs> picture of guts I can find. Feelings and intuition, culture and emotion, dominating our feelings. And this is in practice how we all work most of the time. And I suppose my faint belief is that this could possibly be synthesized into uh, somewhere in between, where you reach your heart, which is some attempt to balance the two, the rational and the gut feelings, in order to produce um, risk analyses that are based on, on sense, conviction, and, um, and acknowledging the, the human aspect of how we deal with uncertainty. Thanks very much.